Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, first of all, I am mindful of the hour. <laughs> and you should know that when I was a young man, the very first speech I gave as an elected official was to a Rotary Club banquet in a town in southeastern Arkansas, and there were 500 people there. 496 were introduced. The other four went home mad. <laughs> Dinner started at 6.30. I got to speak at a quarter to 10. And the man who introduced me had been my leader in that county, and he was so nervous and trying so hard to do a good job. And what he wanted to say was, you ain't seen nothing yet. What he did say was, you know, we could stop here and have had a very nice evening. <laughs> You could stop here and have had a very nice evening. I loved listening to Nancy Pelosi speak. I loved her as speaker. I like her as minority leader. She has made my party proud, and she should make every woman in America proud. I, uh, I want to thank three people who have left, but my Senator Chuck Schumer, Senator Patty Murray, who did a great job on the budget last year, Representative Tammy Duckworth, who we've all got our fingers crossed for, Representative Gwen Moore from Wisconsin, who is a lion. I love her. And um, Ayanna Presley had to go, but I thought she did a great job introducing her, and she's been a great spokesperson for Hillary. And I want to congratulate Krizanta Duran for your speech and for your work and for saying one thing that needs to be said by the progressive forces in this country over and over again. You may not win the first time, the second time, the third time, but if you just keep pushing the rock up a hill, eventually we will prevail. I want to say, too, I like the real Tony Goldwyn as a president better than the one on television. <laughs> he's a very good man. He came to one of our foundation events last year, and he's been a great surrogate for Hillary. I'm, I'm really grateful. This is a special day for me and for our family a year ago today. Hillary announced her campaign, and this is Equal Pay Day. And as we've all been going around the country grappling with the unusual political climate, how's that for understatement? <laughs> I want to just put out, point out one reason it's unusual. As I tried to say when I spoke for President Obama four years ago at the Democratic Convention. I thought then and still believe he's done a far better job than he often gets credit for. But it's important to remember that we have 400 years of good economic history, which shows that not once in all that time, not even once, has a country undergone the kind of financial shock we took and gotten over it in less than 10 years. Now, we got our jobs back in seven and a half years. And I believe if the Democrats could have stayed in the majority in Congress for two or three more years, we would also have the incomes back because they had an investment program that would have tightened the labor market sooner and created more high-paying jobs. But it's worth remembering that we, in my party, we can say all day long that we're the best shape of any big economy in the world. And we are. We're doing, growing better. Uh, as the President said in the State of the Union, we have 14 million new jobs in five years, and that's the most we've had since that other Democrat was in, whatever his name was. <laughs> and we have 90% of our people with health insurance for the first time in the history of the United States Republic. And Even the governor of very Republican Wyoming 
is now trying to persuade the Wyoming legislature to take Medicaid expansion because of the Native Americans, men and women who are lobbying the state legislature there. We're the best positioned country in science and technology. According to all the climate science, we rank first or second in the world in the ability to generate electricity from clean energy sources so that we can create a whole new economy in America and lift the worst consequences of climate change off the shoulders of our children and grandchildren. We have the best system of higher education and training in the world. We need to get more kids in training and pay them more for young people who don't have four-year degrees, and then we got to make college affordable for everyone and make debt manageable. If we do that, we'll be fine. Meanwhile, 80% of the people had not had a pay raise since the crash. On my mother's side, my family is Irish. This is the 100th anniversary of the Easter Uprising in 1916, which led to the creation of the Irish Republic. The great Irish poet, William Butler Yeats, wrote two fabulous poems to capture the moment in time when it was just before the good things that were happening. But the world was falling apart in World War I, and people were dying in the streets in Dublin. They issued a Declaration of Independence a year before women got to vote here that mentions women in the first phrase as equal citizens of Ireland from top to bottom and said there will be no discrimination based on religion or ethnic or racial origin. They want a whole republic. But it was the darkness before the dawn. Yeats's poems had two great lines which explain the current dilemma. One, in the second coming, he said, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Nancy Pelosi made alliances that I didn't think she could make to get things done. But it's so much harder. And underneath it all, that explains the sort of rage of working class people and the anger and anxiety of young people. In Easter 1916, Yeats said, too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. The reason I think this will be a good year for women candidates is that people who have been shut out, left out, subconsciously dissed, are like super sensitive to how people who feel devalued really see the world. And it's no accident, for example, that in Appalachian, West Virginia, they have the second worst economy in America and the highest rate of heroin and prescription drug addiction. Just today, I hope I can say this, I made my fourth call in the last two and a half years to a very good friend of mine whose child mixed alcohol and one of those pills and went to sleep and never woke up. When I was in little, a little Appalachian town of Chillicothe, Ohio, which is the bottom of the Appalachian, I saw them renovating the town, building it anew. And they had all these young medical students coming because they wanted to help poor people who had no access to health care. I met a young woman born in Poland, educated in New York, who gave up all the trappings she could have had to go live in that renovated building in Chillicothe, Ohio. And then people started waving across the street. And I walked over, and the first hand I shook was the hand of a woman who sold her car to open a drug treatment facility, introducing me to three of her clients recovering heroin addicts, and a fourth woman whose husband died of an overdose last year. Now, I'm not trying to bring you down. I'm trying to give you hope for this reason. I think this is the darkness before the dawn. I think America, everything President Obama said in his last State of the Union address is true. We are on the way back. We are in better shape than any place else. 
We have the youngest, most diverse workforce that's worth a lot. Having lost it, I can tell you, in economics, youth matters. It's why we need immigration reform so badly. Why we need for these families to know that they will not be broken up. That the children will not be divided from their parents. There are 11 and a half million undocumented people in this country, but 16 and a half million people affected by it because they're all in the same families. I know some people say we should send them home and build a wall. It's not only unethical, it's terrible economics. <laughs> and we can't let it happen. I believe that women have a unique opportunity in this election to talk sense to people, to explain, for example, on Equal Pay Day, that it's a terrible drag on the economy when you don't make people equally compensated for the same work, that it's a dumb idea for America to be one of only seven countries in the world without any paid leave except in the states that have adopted it, and that the worst thing any society could ever do is to force people to choose between raising their children and succeeding at work. If you have to choose, you lose already. Because there's nothing more important than raising kids, and maybe grandkids. <laughs> but we now no longer rank in the top 10 in the world in the participation of women in the workforce. That's one reason raises are not coming up yet. The labor market's still slack. We don't have the participation rate we need. We were never out of the top 10 when Nancy Pelosi and the other members of Congress that were there when I had the honor to serve. We were always there. Even without paid leave, we were there. We can't get back there without equal pay, paid leave, and affordable childcare. And when we do, the incomes of all Americans will rise and we can all rise together. And when I listen to your honoree, for Santa Duran talk about what she had done in the Colorado legislature. When I listened to Nancy Pelosi talk and I remembered the unusual coalition she was capable of building, when I realized Patty Murray wore her tennis shoes into budget wars with Speaker Ryan and came out with a pretty good deal, I realized that, you know, in an interdependent world with a constitution the framers designed to be hard to promote change. We need people who are rock solid in their convictions and always keep the door open to possibility. We need progressives who don't make the perfect the enemy of the good if the good is good enough. And yet we need to understand that we have some things that have to be non-negotiable, including Supreme Court seats. I mean, if you think about and I don't mean that you should give a prospective judge, you, want, you might appoint the Supreme Court a list of 10 questions and say, if you're not 10 for 10, I'm not appointing you. But look, maybe it's just because I grew up in the South. But I think that voting rights decision that was decided five to four is the worst of all the decisions. And I don't like Citizens United. I don't like a lot of these other decisions. But Look at this room. Look how, more, how much more diverse it is than it would have been even if we'd been trying to help women 30 years ago. We're younger, we got more LGBT people here, we got more people from all over the world here. This is America's future, our diversity. We ought to make it easier to vote, not harder. Much, 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 much easier. And. One of the things that I liked about Hillary's work in the Senate was she worked on that. She tried to make it easier for people whose first language was not English to vote. And she's talked a lot in this campaign about expanding opportunities to vote. You have an award name for Gabby Giffords. In my family, she can do no wrong. Her courage and that of her husband are astonishing. She's probably the reason that Hillary won Arizona by more than everybody thought she would. But 
this is what happened. Arizona used to be covered by the Voting Rights Act. In every county of Arizona, there was one vote voting place for every 2,100 registered voters. Sounds good, right? Except Maricopa County, the biggest one, Phoenix, where there was one for every 20,000. I couldn't make this up. Thank you to the Supreme Court. So I hope the president gets a hearing for Judge Garland. And if he doesn't, we have to realize whether he does or not, the next president may well have two more appointments. And we have to insist that we want a Supreme Court that protects and expands our rights. Just last week, the court voted four to four, hanging on the precipice on a case that would have destroyed the public employee union movement in America. I could give you lots of other examples. Things have been falling apart. We have to restore broad-based growth. We have to start to have incomes rise together again. Young people seem to be most disillusioned and most angry because they don't remember that in the 90s it was really possible for us to grow together. That we moved 100 times as many people out of poverty as when Ronald Reagan was president. And we can do it again. Whether we believe that or not will tell the tale on how this whole election comes out. Not just in the primary, the general, everything. We have to get our mojo back. And I love it when you honor women who make a difference every day and understand that talking and doing are two different things and you gotta keep pushing that rock up the hill until finally you are at the top. And that's what you said. And Tony gave as good an issue speech as I could, so I'm not gonna say that. But we live in an interdependent world. You could put that wall up around Mexico. I don't think you can make the Mexican pay for it, but you could put it up. <laughs> we actually had a funny contest in our office to see who had the best idea to get it financed. <laughs> you could put a wall on the Canadian border. You could enact a giant barrier all along the Pacific coast and a giant barrier all along the Atlantic coast. You could refuse to let planes land, but you cannot keep the social media out. <laughs> and so that's the last thing I wanna say in general terms. Among the many things that I've been proud of Hillary for is that when she was Secretary of State, she didn't just negotiate the Iran sanctions and a new nuclear treaty with Russia and all that stuff that you're supposed to do. <laughs> she also continued to work for women and girls and, and she asked President Obama when he asked her to be Secretary of State, she said, okay, if you really want me to do this, I want you to do something for me. He said, what? He said, I want at least two of those tech wizards you used to beat me in the primary with all their prowess on the social media to go to work for the United States. If we can't beat their argument on the social media in the brains of a billion or more people, we're gonna be in deep trouble. You cannot kill, jail, or occupy all your enemies. You have to convert some. You have to create a common space where people will listen to each other. And so they began. And I think that's why she's been the most outspoken voice in this election against this ridiculous demonization of American Muslims and saying we should never let any Muslims in the country again. That's a dumb, dumb, dumb idea. In California, in San Bernardino, when that terrible thing happened, it's important to remember those people were converted over the social media. And it's important to remember going back a ways that more than 200 of our fellow Americans who were killed on 9-11 were Muslims. I never will forget when Hillary came back to Washington to try to work on putting the city back together with Chuck Schumer and all the House members. Chelsea and I wanted to be useful, so we went down to the center where people were registering their loved ones and uncounted for and all that. And all of you will remember those amazing that wall with all those pictures. 
So we were hanging around waiting to get an assignment, and I decided to go stare at the wall. And I looked up, and this man, much bigger than me, was standing there weeping like a baby. And I said, sir, did you lose anyone? And he turned to me and he said, no, but I hate what was done more than anyone because I love this country and I am an Egyptian Muslim American and I'm so afraid my countrymen will never trust me again. I trust him, you should too. We need to do this together. And every time a woman running on a program of inclusive economics, inclusive societies, and inclusive politics wins, we move a little closer to bringing America back where we can all rise together. It is very important. I'm so grateful for Stephanie and all the, Ellen, thank you for being here, all the people at Emily's List, what, what's been done here on behalf of Hillary, all of us who support and love her are grateful. But the reason I think, even beyond what she achieved as Secretary of State, all the good work she did in the Senate, working with Senator Kennedy to get the first children's health insurance program passed, and you saw it advertised up there, there are now eight and a half million kids who get insurance because of that. Doing something that I never thought she could do, and Nancy will remember this, Hillary went to the Congress one day when I was in the White House to see Tom DeLay. Now, younger people may not remember this, but he made Ted Cruz look like a milk toast. <laughs> there was nobody in the Congress who disliked me any more than he did, with the possible exception of Dick Armey, his running buddy. And she said, Congressman, I know we don't agree on much. And he said, Hillary, do we agree on anything? <laughs> she said, well, you love your children. He said, come on, what's that got to do with anything? She said, look, I know we disagree on nearly everything, but I also know you adopted those kids, and I honor you for it. And she said, this country's foster care system is about to break wide open. Kids are going to start aging out of foster care with no place to live, no training, no skills, no access to college, no way to get a job. They're just going to be thrown on the streets. And they're no different from the kids you adopted. We can't let it happen. And he said, well, what's the problem? She said, for one thing, people are afraid to adopt non-infant children, afraid they can't shape them enough. And they're terrified to adopt if they're middle-class people, children with special needs, afraid that they'll fail all across because they won't be able to afford it. And he said, well, what do you think we should do about it? She said, well, you're a Republican. You love tax cuts. So let's give people a whopping tax credit if they'll adopt a non-infant child. And a bigger one if they'll adopt a child with special needs. And then you've got to be willing to spend some government money to support this process and to help the kids who, through no fault of their own, are going to age out. You cannot allow them to be thrown in the street. Next thing I know, I'm signing a bill. I think there was sort of a, and look, and by the time I left office, there had been an 80% increase in adoption of children out of foster care, 80%. She did that with no office. But it started a long time ago. I talked to Hillary for 30 minutes the first time we were together. And I thought, oh, my God, I've never met anybody like this before. You know, look, we were all activists. Most everybody I knew in law school, and just a couple years earlier in the tumultuous year of 1968, had supported Gene McCarthy or Robert Kennedy for the presidency. And we were passionate about ending the Vietnam War, fighting racism, supporting the emerging women's rights movement, and reducing poverty. Those were our big causes. And I can't get too upset when I see how righteous a lot of these young people are today. I think 
we were probably pretty sanctimonious too. But we'd talk about all this stuff about 15 minutes, and she'd say, yeah, yeah, I know all that. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? How can we make it better? And then she, I'd say, well, you got any ideas? And they were always good. Next thing I know, we're still in law school. We go to Texas to work in a presidential campaign, and she gets a job registering voters in South Texas because the Mexican-Americans have been systematically, culturally shut out of the political system for a century, and they still are. If Hispanic voters in Texas voted in the same percentage as they do in California, Texas would be a swing state today. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. People give up. We are trying to change that. We get out of law school. She gets all these fancy offers. She goes to work for Mary and Edelman at the Children's Defense Fund. And they send her to South Carolina to find out why are 13 and 14 year old African American boys being put in prison with adults for years on end. And she tried to find out and helped to write the report that the Children's Defense Fund submitted. It sparked a whole movement for juvenile justice reform to get kids out of adult prisons. And then the neatest thing she did was go to Alabama, where they were trying to create an alternative segregated illegal school system under the guise of having private academies for which, believe it or not, they were claiming tax credits. And Mary Edelman figured if we could actually document what they were doing, that they'd lose their tax credits and the whole thing would collapse. So Hillary alone goes to Dothan, Alabama in 1973. This is the gutsiest thing she ever did. I'm surprised she got out of town. She goes into this school, talks to the admissions person, says she's just a simple housewife, that her husband got a job in this town and her son needs a place to go to school and would you talk to me about the school? And they make a small talk and then she says, wait a minute, cut to the chase. Just tell me yes or no. If I put my son here, will he be in an all white school or not? Yes or no? And the guy said, absolutely. And she had him. They lost their tax credits. These private academies all over the South lost their tax credit because she always makes something good happen. And, and in my part of the country, we don't believe that people like Nancy Pelosi can't maintain a House majority because we're not far left enough. We've been living with the reality of grading, difficult, challenging social change. And when she got 78% of the vote in the Alabama primary and about 92 or 93% of the African-American vote, one of my African-American friends called me and said, that can't be true, did that happen? And he said, I, he said, yeah. He said, why, how? And I told him the story. He said, I get that. And that explains the South Carolina folk. And when she came to Arkansas, she brought legal services, all these poor mountain people who had never had the protections of the civil justice system. Oh, they were working all right, but they didn't have any money, and they could be worked over. And she talked them into creating the first legal aid clinic. Then President Carter put her on the Legal Services Board, and at 29, she was and still remains the youngest person ever to chair that board because of the records she had established. And it's just always been like that. When I was governor, she rolled in one day to see me, and she said, uh, she was like a kid with a new toy. She said, you know, Bill, she said, all these African-American kids in the Mississippi Delta and all these kids in the old dark mountains that was our Appalachia, we had six of the poorest, 20 poorest counties in America then, they're all starting school. They can't read, write, or count. They can't possibly make it. They'll never make it. And their parents can't either. And I just heard about this program in Israel called Home Instruction Program for Preschool Youngsters. Great ac acronym for children of the 60s, hippie. Yeah, right. And said, they take all these immigrants who come to Israel who can't speak English or Hebrew, 
and they teach them to read, write, and count along with their children so that they become their children's first teacher. I think it will work here. I said, well, Hillary, that sounds great. What are we going to do about it? We're out here in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas. She said, oh, I did it. I called the lady that started the program. She'll be here in 10 days. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm being dragged around. Keep in mind now, this was in the early 80s. There was no universal preschool anywhere. I'm being dragged around to all these little preschool graduations <laughs> with these parents weeping like children because they can finally teach their kids something and get them off to a good start. Next thing I know, it's in 26 states. And for years, the program was run by Miriam Westheimer, who is the daughter of the famous Dr. Ruth Westheimer. And all over America today, there are thousands of people under 40 who got better starts in life and went further and had better lives. Just because she always makes something good happen. This is not some later thing. So I think that explains why you endorsed her. More than her gender, you want somebody who will make something happen. If you think we're just this close to coming back, you need the change maker. You need somebody who always figures out, given any set of challenges, how to make the best possible outcome and avoid the worst around the world and at home. And she's the best at that I have ever known. And I must say, we were all chapped in our gender stereotypes when we met. But I asked her three times to marry me before she finally said yes. And after the second time, I made the mistake of being candid. I said, I, I want you to marry me, but I don't think you should do it. And she said, well, that's a terrible way to make a sale. What do you mean? I said, Hillary, I know all these people that have been in the anti-war movement and all this, all the people are just, you're the best I've ever seen. You, you're the best change maker. You always figure out how to make something happen. And it's an unbelievable gift. You need to be in public life. So you should go home to Chicago or go to New York, get some kind of whatever job you want, do a legal, be a legal aid offer, but go someplace where you can run. I have to go back to Arkansas or I will evaporate as a person. It's what I have to do. And she started laughing. She said, oh, you got to be kidding. She said, no one would ever vote for me for anything. You could just turn me into a cartoon, one more pushy woman, which God knows the Republicans have tried to do in the last four years. <laughs> so she came. Turned out to be a good strategy. But I was thrilled <clears throat> when Charlie Rango called her and asked her to come to New York and think about running for senator. And I watched her convert all these people, one after another. When she ran for re-election, I'll never forget the head of the Farm Bureau on Long Island, the lifelong Republican, endorsed her because she'd helped them market their food in local markets and promoted organic farming and other things that raised their incomes and made their incomes more steady and she'd help the wine, wine growers upstate for the first time systematically sell their wine in New York City restaurants. So anyway, they endorsed her. And I happened to be out there one day and the press goes running up to this guy who's the head of the Farm Bureau and said, did you really endorse Hillary Clinton? He said, yeah. He said, I, I thought you were a big Republican. He said, I did too. <laughs> and so the, the reporter said, well, why did you do it? He said, look, everybody sounds great at election time. All I know is I've been doing this a long time, trying to help all these family farmers. And she is the only person who ever actually did anything for us. That's what we need in a president again. Somebody gets a show on the road that does things that allow us to rise together, that allow us to come together, that brings women's pay up, that helps families to be stronger through paid leave and affordable childcare that reforms the immigration system and invests in modern infrastructure. There's a lot more than Flint, Michigan out there with kids with elevated lead levels in their blood. And think how many jobs we could create if we tore all the pipes up and gave every child in America a healthy future. We've got a lot to do, a lot to do. And you know, you can discount everything I say. You say, what the heck? They've been married over 40 years. He's got to say that. 
But you ought to give me some credit for having a sense of know what it would take for us all to rise together. To have African American and Hispanic family income having the highest percentage increases. We did that. To move in a hundred times as many people out of poverty. We did that. I don't want you to think about that. I'm just telling you we can do it again. And so many young people who don't remember that, even if they're optimistic about their own future, don't think we can do it again. So you get in your corner, I'll get mine, and we'll just fight like the devil until one of us no longer exists. We can build this country together again. You just gave an award to somebody in Colorado who lives on the cutting edge of people fighting each other all the time. We can do this. This is still the greatest country in the world. We don't need to be made great again. We need to be made whole again. And so I thank you for all you've done for. I thank you for all you've done to support these other women running for the Senate, for the House, for the governorship, for legislative positions. I thank you for making a difference. America's a better place now because we have more women in politics. I, I, I see them everywhere. People I saw when they were young legislators that Emily's List found and nurtured and supported, moving into senior positions, changing the face of America going forward. It's time to break the last grass ceiling. Yes, I think it would be very good for America and the world if we elected the first woman president. Yes, <laughs> yes, I think it would be very good for America and the world to have someone who could immediately call and deal with people in the most complex areas to figure out, for example, how not to let the Syrian refugee crisis basically send Europe back 50 years in its basic humanity and dealing with people who are different, who need a place to come, who could figure out how we could carve out a safe zone in Syria for the 90 plus percent of them who want to go back home. I think a lot of those things were good. But the main thing is I think it'd be best at this time, after so much gridlock and everything Nancy Pelosi told you about the presidential campaign reflecting the congressional reality is 100 percent true. I think a lot of reasons the other Republicans don't like Trump is he treated them the way they always treated us. That's about the only thing I liked about his campaign. It was, uh, but it's not good for us. Nothing big ever came of being small, ever. And so I appreciate you. America's worth fighting for. Your kids' and grandkids' future are worth fighting for. And we are just this close. And a lot of it is because of Emily's List. You know it, I know it. It's time to go claim it. Thank you and God bless you. <laughs>